Hi, I'm Bill Cook. We're out here in Duncan, Arizona doing some gardening and some garden videos. And today we're talking about uh, companion planting. So what are what does companion planting do? Well, you know, companion plants can provide support. They can provide shelter. They can provide nutrient value. And they can help an awful lot towards controlling insects. Uh, the possibilities are endless if you just observe the garden and uh, you know keep some notes and just apply what you what you're learning out there so the most commonly used example is the three sisters garden method where you plant corn pole beans and usually winter squash or pumpkins together so how does that work well the beans need something to climb so they climb up the corn corn's a pretty heavy feeder the beans are fixing nitrogen in the soil and they're helping to provide nitrogen for the corn. And then of course the winter squash, the vines run out all over the place and they tend to shade the soil. They keep the soil cooler. The other plants are happy and you're not losing as much water from the sun. So the Three Sisters is an example of a, of a good working system that has been in use for thousands of years. So we've got the, the support, nitrogen fixing, shade. What else can we do with that? Well, we can grow a cover crop in our garden and then till it in next year and we can provide green manure. We can use legumes and fix nitrogen with a cover crop. We can use a cover crop between the rows in our orchard. What we're looking at here is an example of legumes as a companion to my fruit orchard. Now these are a little small at the moment, but in a very short time these will completely fill in between the rows. They will cool the soil and I use less water. What is typically a three and a half, four hour cycle when the beans fill in will be reduced to about two and a half hours. It seems counterintuitive because you would think more plants, more water. But if you stick a soil thermometer in the ground, it'll become clear pretty quick how much these cool the ground. And then of course, I get the beans and then till in the residue. And at the same time, the roots are going down deep, penetrating and opening up this heavy clay soil. So there's a multitude of advantages to planting these beans, cow peas, all that stuff. You can work companion plants while we're talking about nitrogen fixing legumes. Uh, you can work that into your crop rotation schedule. Insects, you know, a, a lot of people First thing they think of is insects because they're pretty obvious out there. You chew it on your plants. So how would companion planting apply to insect control? Well, it's pretty simple. Um, companion plants can disrupt their travel. A good example of that is the cucumber beetle. The cucumber beetle does not do much damage with its feeding as an adult. But what it does do is it moves down the row of cucumbers, cantaloupes, watermelon, whatever, and the cucumber beetle spreads bacterial wilt. So what I do to prevent that travel, to disrupt their travel, is I interplant my cucurbits with beans, with cucurbits, with beans. That way the cucumber beetle, when he's going down the row, chomping on those cucumbers, all of a sudden he runs into beans and he goes, that tastes awful. Turns around and goes right back. It doesn't stop the damage, but it prevents the spread. So here's an example of how we're, how we're disrupting their travel. You'll see these are cow peas and we've got watermelon and cantaloupe on each side. So these are favorite foods for the cucumber beetle. So as he comes down the row, spreading bacterial wilt, He'll run into these beans, turn around, and stay where he is, rather than going the entire length of the row. So we're, we're, not really preve we're not preventing the damage, we're just limiting it. That's a real good example. You can repel insects with companion plants. The most widely used and most commonly known is marigolds. Marigolds tend to 
offend a lot of insects that would otherwise like to be in there chomping on your plants. Another good thing that uh, marigolds repel is nematodes. Now granted, you may have to grow those marigolds for at least a full season or a couple years before you get any really noticeable results, but it does work. Onions, garlic, those sort of things repel quite a few insects and I think to some degree rabbits, uh, you know, rodents and stuff like that. So here's an example where we're using onions as a repellent. These grapes are virtually pest free and if you start walking around the place you're going to find thrips, maybe some white flies, a skeletonizer or two where there aren't, but everywhere I've got these onions so it appears to work. And of course the beauty of it is I am a seed saver so in the process of saving seeds for next year, I drop a bunch and this bed along this fence has turned into a perennial onion patch. So there will always be onions around the grapes that I have planted on this fence. What else? How about, how about attract insects? So attracting certain insects to the garden is good as long as you're attracting the beneficial insects. A really good example of that is giant sunflowers. I plant a lot of those. That's my number one pest control. The sunflowers are the favorite food of white flies, uh, mites, aphids, anything that likes a sugary plant, even a fig leaf beetle. So the benefit of having that in there though it seems counterintuitive to be calling in the white flies, is that the predators, the wasp, can spot those sunflowers and they'll come flying in and hang around your garden, lay eggs, feed on the pests that are on your sunflowers, and of course move on to the rest of your garden. So right next to the devil claw, this is actually my half ton Chevy in the garden. This plant does most of my insect management. This is a giant sunflower. They get about 10, 12 feet tall. They are the favorite food of white flies, you name it. As a matter of fact, if you look, you can see the damage is already beginning on these plants. So, even though it is providing a place for the white flies, thrips, etc., to uh, live a happy life, this will draw in countless um, wasp. And the thing about wasp, we all we all know the big, you know, the big yellow jacket, the mud daubers, the big ones. But for every kind of big wasp, there's probably a half a dozen wasps that are so small that you just can't see them. Some of the trichogamma wasp can fly through the eye of a needle. All wasp are predators. They're either a parasite or they, they eat the insects directly. So their wasps are good to have. And I know a lot of people don't like the idea of hanging around with a bunch of wasps, but if you leave them alone, they'll leave you alone. And nothing will draw them in better than these sunflowers. Attracting bugs away from your garden. Cucumber beetle, there's nothing in this world they like better than corn silk. And so I have in the past planted, I call it the sacrificial corn, away from the garden you know, 10, 15 yards. And son of a gun, those cucumber beetles, they'll go right over there. There are a few plants that actually almost serve as a trap. If devil's claw grows where you live, you can let a little devil's claw grow out in your garden. Over here, it comes up everywhere. And I leave one or two. Well, if you turn that leaf over and you look at the bottom, you will see all kinds of small critters, gnats, aphids, all kinds of small insects that have gone to the bottom side of that leaf, maybe for shade or food or whatever, and they got stuck to it. They're actually stuck. If you look really close, get out your magnifying glass, this time of year you're almost guaranteed to find some aphid mummies. So this is one of the devil claw that grows around here, but my favorite thing about it is that the plant is sticky. 
And if you look under a leaf like this, you will see all kinds of insect pest stuck to the bottom of that leaf. You can actually provide egg laying habitat even. Good for example, late spring, early summer, your lettuce will start to bolt. And then of course there are the wild lettuces, you know, sow thistle, prickly lettuce. Well, if you just let one of those every so far grow in your garden, when it gets that thick pulpy stalk, you can start looking on that plant under the leaves and on the stalk and what are you going to find? Little tiny orange torpedo shaped ladybug eggs. And of course where else would a ladybug lay her eggs if she had a choice of putting them where the aphids are, right? So that's insect control. You can shelter plants, you can put smaller plants that are more sensitive to the wind, and the sun, you can plant those in the shade of larger plants. Uh, again, the possibilities are absolutely endless. So in order to take advantage of these endless opportunities, what is the first step? Well, the first step is to keep a logbook. Keep notes of what you're growing in your garden. Dates, mark it on a calendar, something like that. Keep your observations. You will want to keep a legend of what you planted and where you planted it. And again, this is going back to crop rotation. Granted, planting and interplanting does complicate your crop rotation for the next year, but you will definitely find it worth the effort. So here on this squash, we get a lot of squash bugs. And what I like to do, and you can't see them down in there, but I like to put a little ring of radishes around the squash when I put the seeds in the ground. And even though the radishes suffer for lack of sunshine, it seems to really help with the squash bug. Okay, I was pulling a weed. 